Hi, welcome to the ninth part of the C++ guide for the JavaScript developer. I'm Oscar, and today I would like to revisit pointers. So we're gonna go over some more complex examples. Uh, still no real life example. This is something that I would like to explore on a video of its own. So today we're just gonna go over the quirks and hopefully expand your mental model about pointers. So we saw in a previous lesson that if I declare a variable by using the asterisk operator, I can create a pointer and by using the ampersand operator, I can get the memory address of a variable, right? So this one gets me the address. This one creates a special variable that is a pointer. And I can just print this out. And ideally, I would get the address of the variable on memory. So now one of the interesting behaviors is that I can actually create a pointer to a pointer. And I can use the same ampersand operator on the pointer itself. If I print this out, then I would expect to have two different memory addresses. And that's the case. Um, the first one is the memory address of my A variable and the second one is the memory address of the pointer to the A variable. Now one funny use case that I didn't cover the first time we visited pointers is how to dereference pointers, right? So by using the ampersand operator I get the memory address but how do I return from a uh, in, from the pointer itself into the um, data that I had in the beginning. What we are supposed to use is one more time the asterisk operator, but this time on the operation itself, not on the declaration of the variable, just on the variable. So the semantics are confusing. I know, I don't know why they decided to use the same operator, um, but it just changes its behavior depending if you declare the variable or if you are somehow using it. So here you can see if I dereference the pointer, then I get back the value. And I can actually do the same with the pointer to my pointer. If I do it like this, then I'm traversing back through my memory, right? I'm going from this pointer to this one and finally reading the value that I have in memory. Great, so let's go to a very a more complex example. So let's say I want to declare an array of strings, not a dynamic array. We saw in a previous lesson that we can use vectors. This is just a regular fixed size array. And I'm just going to call it arguments because I'm going to use it afterwards. And I'm going to give it a fixed size of three. Now we didn't take a look into this before, but this is the syntax to create in a fixed size array on C++. And I'm just going to put some data in there. It's not very important what right now. So let's see what happens if I First of all, just print out the variable that I created, that is the argument. And this gives, this gives me a memory address. Now you would think, because I use here the pointer for a character, this is the pointer of the character itself. But this is where one needs to be careful. Again, C++ is very low level. So now let's just think about how would we represent such a thing in memory. So let's say, for example, you know, this is my memory and I want to store this array of strings. What I could do, my first approach could be doing something like, well, I have the first character and then using the same knowledge that we knew before from uh, the strings video, I need to terminate the string, right? 
then I could put the B2 or you know, just the B character, then the two character, then I finish my second string and then I do the same for my final string. Now the problem is how do I know when my array has ended? Right? If I if I give you this and I tell you, you know, just give me the array, just return the, the element in the array, how do I know when I have to start stop reading the memory? Because here's gonna be more data, right? Here um, something else could have written, you know, a new array could start here that has nothing to do with my program. The memory is in there anyways, right? So if I just give you this information, there is no way for you to know when does the array end. So therefore, we, you need to have a little bit more information in your memory in order to reconstruct this array. That's where the fixed array or the fixed size of it comes into play. Because if you have a fixed size, you can actually encode the beginning of each one of the elements. So on this case, I have a size of three. So basically on my start of the array, I can just say this, the first element starts at address. Well, it's not going to be zero, but let's say, you know, something like seven, for example. Then the next element, is going to start at position, if this is position seven, eight, then nine. Then the final element is going to start at position um, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. And finally, I have to mark the end of my array. So now you can see with the initial um, sequence of pointers, I can finally re reconstruct or have enough information to reconstruct an array. And that's basically what's being what's uh, being represented here. So if I go and say please dereference the pointer, so the first pointer And I print that out. Um, well, sorry, this needs to be commented out. What I'm going to get is the first element of my array because this is going to be the pointer or the very first pointer to my string. If I do something like this, then what I'm going to get is the pointer to the second string, not my string itself, just the pointer to it. If I do it like this, then I'm going to get the pointer to the first part of my string. Now let's say, for example, I want to get the entire length of my string. Or let's just look at it in a different way. Let's say what happens if I Mm, yeah, let's say I want to get the length of my array. Now, C++ and C has a operator for you. That's the size of operator. So what happens if I do the size of my argument? I am going to get 24. Now, on a first look, you might start thinking, well, 24, maybe it's the entire number of bytes of my array, but 
that's not true. You know, the entire size of my array is a lot bigger than uh, 24 bytes. Um, so let's just think about this for a little bit. If I know that the original pointer, my Rx pointer, is meant to represent the contents of my array, then the size of that array will be the size of all the pointers that are pointing to the elements in the array, right? So depending on the architecture and the size of your um, machine's memory, this is going to change a little bit, right? Because it could be that if you are on a on a 32-bit machine, right, then your address space will need four bytes per each one of um, of these elements. But if you are on a 64-bit architecture, then each one of these addresses will take eight bytes. So now if you think about it that way, then you can see that we have one, two, three, four pointers. That is the first pointer to this element, the pointer to this element, and the pointer to this element, plus the null terminator, right? So we have four memory addresses. You multiply four times eight for all the bytes that you need, and we get 24 bytes. Now, if I do the size of the D reference, then you can see that each one of the original pointers takes eight bytes. So it makes sense, right? If we have three elements plus the null terminator and each one of them takes eight bytes, we finally have 24 bytes. So finally, I can get the entire size or the count of my array by taking the total size of the pointers and I divide it by the size of each individual pointer. And finally, you can see my array has three elements, as we said in the beginning. Now, <laughs> you can see dealing with memory on a very lower level, it gets fairly complicated. So let's just say we're going to explore one pattern that's very used in the C world and some of the libraries. Um, it will also be used on the React Native JSI. So there is a special type of variable called sized t, which is meant to represent the length of each reference that you have in memory. So I'm going to call this the count, and this is going to be the size of my array. Let me just delete all of this. Now, there is a reason why this is its own special variable instead of, let's say, an int. As we saw before, an int in a lot of the architectures and compilers takes 32 bits, all right, or four bytes. But as we just saw, depending on the architecture of, or your, of your machine, this will not be always true. It could be 64 bits you could have even more funny architectures where this is even larger, right? You could have 128 bits and so on and so forth. Therefore, the size T type is meant to be a uh, type safe, right? It's meant to be a lot safer than just using integers or some more basic type. It will adjust to the architecture of your system. So let's say I want to operate on my array of data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function 
I'm going to uh, I'm going to call it process argument and this function is going to receive a pointer to the arrays right this is an array pointer once again you're going to receive a pointer that points to the array but the array is composed of character pointers and i'm going to call this argument and i oh no, sorry it already has a name i don't need to do it and finally i'm going to receive the size of the array so now i'm just going to do a simple int loop and i'm going to say while is minor uh, to my size t e plus plus or sorry to my count then i'm just going to print out my arguments on i let's compile this and it's not working oh i need to call it mm -hmm. sorry uh, process arguments with my arguments and my count great so this is an interesting pattern because this is basically the only way you're gonna able, be able to pass certain objects around right you cannot pass by value complex objects complex instances you have to pass pointers so you're going to see this in a lot of C libraries in C++ as well where you get uh, a pointer to the object that you're going to try to operate on and depending on the object you go you're going to have to pass some extra metadata in order to do certain operation right so in the case of arrays you need to pass the size of the arrays because C++ doesn't know how to copy by value the moment you call a function. Now, here we just discuss it's not quite safe to use an integer, right? Because the integer will overflow before we might reach the maximum size of our, our array. So this is kind of one of this is one of the many bugs that can happen when you're dealing with memory if you're not super sure of the architecture of your system um, you could overflow your memory your counters and then bad things happen right but just for this example it's enough for me because i know my array will never be bigger i can just use an integer if not i should probably use a long or you know even safer a size t Great. So hopefully this will um, this would be a nice example for you to learn about pointers. And next up, I will we will take a look into the JSI or uh, into the compilation pipelines.